Greetings and salutations. Let me tell you what, gang. It has been one nasty, rainy, windy, yucky day. Here I am stuck in the house. I've been going through a bunch of your comments and questions that have come to me through YouTube, through the Easy Linux website, all kinds of places. And I've put some together and I figured we'd go ahead and answer some in a video. This is what I call Easy Linux Q&A and this is episode 17. I can't believe we've done 17 of these things, but here we go. First question. Hello, Joe. Just watched your video on your new PC. Noticed you had MX Linux in a VM. This is true. Just wondered what you thought about it. I have mixed feelings about MX Linux. There are some things about it that I really like, like the fact that it's based on Debian, which makes it stable, and the fact that the developers make installing software super easy. As a matter of fact, you can use Debian or Ubuntu uses the same thing. It's called apt, and that's the tool that you use to install things. And in uh, MX Linux, you can just pretty much put any package in there and it will it'll be there either from the Debian repositories or it'll be from their repositories. Uh, th that's really cool. I like that aspect of the system. What I don't particularly like is the way they have executed their XFCE desktop. I think it's a little bit weird. I also don't like the fact that the centerpiece of the distribution for some reason or the other seems to be Conky, which is running in the middle of the desktop when you set it up. And they even have a little graphic tool in there that you can tweak Conky. I don't care much about Conky. So there's some, there's some strangeness to it. But there's some really cool things. It seems to be very stable. It is very lightweight. It does not use System D. It uses Run It. So if you're not a System D fan for whatever reason, there you go. You have an option. And it seems to work quite well, and some people really, really love it. Whether it's my daily driver, I don't know. I don't think so. But I do respect it. I think it's a very cool little distribution of Linux. And to each their own, as far as that is concerned. we got more questions about Linux distributions coming up. And thank you, Steve, for that question. Joe, I'm a newbie. Please bear with me. I've installed Linux Mint Cinnamon 19, and it seems to work great using Ethernet, but it does not recognize Wi-Fi at all. I've downloaded the latest Linux driver from the adapter maker, but don't know how to install it. Well, there you go. <laughs> we'll talk about that in just a couple of minutes. Newbie, remember, and have a new router running 802.11ac, which works great with a laptop I have also running Mint. Any help will be greatly appreciated. I welcome step-by-step step if possible. Well, since you didn't give me the information like exactly what card it was, what drivers you were using, there's no way that I could possibly give you step-by-step. Step. As a matter of fact, I don't give anybody step-by-step step when it comes to stuff like this because the truth of the matter is even if you download those drivers, a lot of the times they don't work. They're either out of date or they, for some reason, just don't compile properly even if you follow the step-by-step -step instructions. OEM, those are people that distribute this hardware, providers. The OEMs, uh, they either do it right or they don't. And the right way to do that would be to provide a driver that would go directly into the Linux kernel so that you wouldn't have to worry about any of this or create a package which could go into a repository or a PPA that you would be able, be able to hook up to Linux Mint. And unfortunately, not every hardware provider out there bothers. They don't want to take the time. They will say something is Linux compatible and then it isn't. So uh, the other thing is even if you downloaded and installed those drivers and they worked, you may end up with a situation where what if the machine crashes and you have to reinstall it? Will they be available again? Can you get them reinstalled? See, it gets a little tricky. My solution to this problem, and believe me, it's 98% of the Wi-Fi stuff out there works just fine with Linux, either with a driver you install from the driver manager the way you're supposed to, or it just works. There's like 2% out there that falls under this category that just doesn't work at all. When you run across this, best thing that you can do is hop on the internet on a machine that you can get on the internet with and order yourself up a little USB Wi-Fi adapter that you can plug into the laptop and 
that way you can have uh, you know Wi-Fi capability and if you do a little bit of research you know Wi-Fi USB adapter that works with Linux do that do that search many many of them will come up and you shouldn't have too much of an issue from that point forward it's just a much simpler way of dealing with the problem than it is trying to you know hack a driver into this thing to make it work and it might work and it might not work and I don't know and I can't support you I'm not sitting in front of the machine also I want to say Jess uh, you know I, I sent him basically that answer I asked him if he'd looked in the made sure that you know did you look in the actual driver manager and all that stuff and, and I was kind of taken aback because I got a response where it says, you're not Joe Collins. Joe Collins would have helped me. And I guess I I made a mistake and, and some crazy stuff. And I sent something back and I just basically said what I just said. I answer all of these inquiries on the website. It's nobody else. It's me. And so therefore, you don't have to worry about getting somebody else, folks. It's me. And I do try and help. But in this particular situation... There's just not an easy answer other than to replace the hardware, either in the laptop or get yourself a USB dongle. That's it. I mean, that's all you can do. Fortunately, as time progresses, this becomes less and less and less of an issue. It really is on the OEMs whether they want to support Linux or not and whether they're going to make drivers available in such a way that they're easy for users to install or they're in the kernel already and they do not have to be installed. That's up to them. And we just have to wait for that to catch up. So, next question. I can't seem to stop distro hopping between elementary OS 5.0, Ubuntu 18.10, and Mint 19. I hope it, this is not being too nosy, but I was wondering if you still use Mint as your daily driver or if you have moved on to something else. If so, what are your reasons? Okay, since... Ubuntu 18.04 went into beta. I have been running it pretty much continuously on my main machine. I am not running Linux Mint 19 anywhere in my house. I am running Linux Mint, but it's Linux Mint 18.3, and it's on an old Core Duo machine that will not run Ubuntu 18.04 or Linux Mint 19 with the 4.15 kernel. There is a bug in it. Uh, so that's why that machine is continuing to run 18.3. It's the one that my kids use, and they like it, and there's no reason to change it, and it's doing everything they need to do. So my machine runs Ubuntu, and Cindy's laptop runs Ubuntu. Her machine got installed with Ubuntu shortly before it became designated at her, as her computer. She has really enjoyed using it, and it has worked great for her, so she is still on it. The reason why I'm on Ubuntu is because Ubuntu 18.04 for me on my hardware on two machines, there's Cindy's laptop, there's this laptop, has been the most stable Linux experience I have ever had in my life. It is not the most newbie friendly to install Ubuntu. I have put up videos showing you a bunch of the steps that you have to do to get it going and everything. And it's not as easy as Linux Mint. But for what I do... And on my network and my workload and everything, it's just working great. I have never once had it lock up, freeze, quit working. I've had no major issues of any kind. Updates have installed flawlessly. We have rolled along. The only thing that I have run into was a bug with the CD burner. I did a video about that. Hey, I don't burn CDs very often these days, but sometimes I do. And that's how I ran into that bug. So for a long time, it didn't affect me at all. Uh, that may be the, I don't know. I don't know if that affects people in Linux Mint or not, but there it is. So that's why I have been running it. I still say Linux Mint is the best for a new user, just simply because it's all laid out. It's a very traditional design. I love Linux Mint. Don't get me wrong. I have no hate for Linux Mint. It's just that I am more comfortable these days running Ubuntu with Ubuntu spin on the GNOME desktop. Uh, it works great and does what I need it to do. So whatever you want to do is entirely up to you. I'm not going to pick for you. You're just going to have to settle down on something. But I would say that it would probably be best if you're going to be running Ubuntu to stick with the long-term support release and don't use the short-term release there, those interim releases, uh, Ubuntu 18.10. That's only going to be supported through August of next year. So thank you for the question, Tony. I hope that answers your question. And keep us posted as to what you're going to do here. Now, 
We're switching over to Ubuntu comments now, I can tell you, because on Ubuntu these days, I don't get a lot of questions. What I get are people making comments of one sort or another. And this is one I actually wanted to talk about a little bit for those of you who are new to the channel. And if you're watching this video and you've gone this far, it probably doesn't bother you. But I get inundated constantly uh, with comments like this. Uh, this is from UB. You see that. It says, Joe Collins, could you please publish a short three-minute version of just the central five mistakes? 41 minutes is too long. Now, that refers to a video where I took two years of personal research and put it all together and I did this video called the top five mistakes new Linux users make and I went through and explained a lot of stuff and I uh, got a couple of the graphics wrong and misspelled a word in there and people have pounded on that and then uh, another thing that I hear constantly is the videos too long the videos too long the videos too long gang that's how long it's going to take me to talk I can't make it any shorter and I certainly can't take 41 minutes and cram it down in two three minutes the format of this channel is long form videos they run anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes long usually some of the videos I have posted run as much as an hour especially the in-depth install videos the reason why I do that is because first of all breaking things up into parts on YouTube that is incredibly frustrating how many times have you watched somebody who has posted something really interesting and there are six parts to it and you can't find part five? It just won't show up. You search for it. They didn't reference it right. You've looked on their channel and you just cannot come across it. So that's why if I post a video, I post it all in one big chunk. And also, this is like a talk show format. We're hanging out. We're talking. This is for entertainment purposes. The videos that I post are not necessarily... I mean, yeah, a lot of them are how-to, but we're doing it in an easygoing, slow style so that people can just kind of hang out and learn at a slow pace. They're not meant to be reference videos that show you something in three minutes. YouTube, especially with Linux, is absolutely packed with those kind of videos. And if that's what you're looking for, keep on going. There's just no way that I'm going to be able to get the you know what I do down to three minutes just not gonna happen uh, and it's and it's I have no desire to do that either uh, which goes to show that you can't please everyone but I did want to comment on that because I get it all the time it's like but that's what the channel does every video I post is like that and I think what it really comes down to is that a lot of kids watch YouTube although the profile picture of UB there did not look like he was a kid a lot of kids watch YouTube, a lot of young people, and I found that that generation, the millennials, I know they catch a lot of shit from people, but it's true. They have no attention span. They have no patience. They don't want to hang out and watch a video. I do videos like the kind of videos I like to watch. Okay, One of my favorite YouTubers is a fellow named Musty1, M-U-S-T-I-E, number one. One of my favorite YouTubers. Not about Linux. He is a guy who works on cars and bikes and snowblowers and lawn tractors and all kinds of crazy stuff. And he puts it up on his YouTube channel. Motorcycles and bicycles and electric bikes and everything. And he just It's just hanging out with him in his garage while he's wrenching on stuff and working on it. I find it absolutely soothing and wonderful to watch. And I hope that some of you find my videos that way. So that's basically what that's all about and why I wanted to, you know comment on that was I get so many of those and honestly I just ignore him ignore him this is what we do here this it is what it is ignore them that's what I was trying to say thank you it came out all right what keyboard are you using I use a variety of keyboards actually most of them junk <laughs> uh, I was using a Logitech keyboard for a long time like 10 years one that I bought for $12 online. It was actually really nice. It was that, I uh, wish I could remember the uh, exact model number. It was like a, I don't know, K104 or something like that. Great keyboard. They still sell them. Then I spent like $35 and bought a Lenovo keyboard. It was supposed to be all professional and stuff. I didn't use that thing for more than a year, Jack, before the keys started sticking. It started feeling mushy, and I gave up. So now what I'm using is an HP keyboard that I bought off of Amazon.com for 10 bucks, and they're still up there. 
I, I'm not one of those people that wants to get into a big keyboard, uh, you know, a lot of money into a keyboard. You, I, you trash them anyway. You use them all the time. You spill stuff in them. Forget it. I'm not throwing that kind of money into it. I do like keyboards that have high keys, though. I don't like chiclet style keyboards. And um, I think the one I'm using right now is half height, which is okay. I'd, I'd like to have full height, which is what the Lenovo was. But like I said, the Lenovo had some endurance issues. So right now it's a cheap HP keyboard. And what I look for usually is just a standard 102 key keyboard. I never get anything that has any extra keys because I don't know what I'm going to be plugging it into. And I want to make sure that it's going to work perfectly with uh, all the different Linux distributions that I try and mess with and everything. So I make it a very standard 102 key keyboard. So I wish one day you would post together a tutorial on wine. For the life of me, I don't know the proper procedures to make Windows apps run in Linux with the help of Wine. Well, neither do I, which is the reason why I don't post videos on Wine. Let me give you my opinion on Wine. Wine is a hack. It is a way to try and get Windows programs to run on Linux. If you have a very in-depth Wine installation installed, you have several programs, especially anything that's internet facing, then it makes your Linux machine vulnerable to the same kind of malware and viruses that you can get on Windows. That's one reason I don't use it. Number two, not everything works on Wine. And you always hear that somebody somewhere got it running, but you can't figure out how, you know, that sort of thing. So anyway, what I did was a long time ago, ago was, is I just cut the cord. I said, look, I said, I'm not going to use any software that comes from Microsoft or runs on Windows. I have no reason to do that in my life. And I have found alternative software that is native to Linux, whether it be part of the distribution or whether I install it from a third party place, you know, like from a vendor, a PPA, a Snap, whatever. I'm going to use software that's been written to run on Linux. I have no desire to try and hack a Windows program to get it to run on Linux. There are alternatives out there for everything. And people say, well, I absolutely have to have Photoshop. No, you don't. You can learn how to use GIMP. GIMP is just as good in a lot of ways. It's different, and it takes a while to learn it, but it works just as well. And for like 90% of the people out there, it'll work just fine. If you want to you know, keep the uh, connection going to the Windows world and torture yourself like that, knock yourself out, have a good time, I can't help you because I gave up on wine a long time ago. I just don't use it. I don't think wine is a good idea, honestly. If it got to a place where I needed Windows software bad enough, I would either put it in a virtual machine, install Windows in a virtual machine, put the software on that, or I would go get another physical machine. And I mean, it would really be painful and it would hurt and it would probably make me throw up several times during the process, but I would actually get a machine and install Windows on it so that I could run Windows programs. I mean, it would be horrible, but I'd do it. I just don't want the wine program and all of the little tentacles that it puts into my Linux system. Not into that at all. So I just thought I'd throw that out there, gang. This is an interesting question, and I cannot find a direct answer to it. And this is why I have uh, included it here. I think this person's name is Iason or Asen, Ison. I don't know how to pronounce your name, but it is a very good question. Do you know if Microsoft can take back their patents or is it a one-way uh, railroad it's quite a big deal if they can take them back after they have been implemented in linux good question oh by the way thank you t i believe it's tia or tia that's what that for the question above that about wine Thank you for that. I want to. Some people don't read these things. Some people are just listening. But that came from somebody who identified themselves as TIA, TIA or TIA or whatever that is. Anyway, back to the question that we're on. Why do you have to be so confusing? I don't know. It's just the way my brain works. I don't know. Uh, I'm not really sure how this is going to work. I don't know whether they've just dropped the patents and open sourced them entirely, or whether it's a matter of they have said we have the patent but we won't pursue you. 
Somebody said in a comment that that's what's really going on here. It's not that they have opened it up and said we no longer you know claim any right to it or put it under like uh, some sort of GPL license or MIT license or some open source thing. What they've basically done, I think, is to say that they're not going to pursue anybody, which kind of bothers me a little bit because as I stated in the big long video I posted about this called If You Can't Beat Them, Buy Them, then what could happen is that we could have a shift in management at Microsoft. You know, they're all lovey-dovey. We love Linux and we want to be part of it right now and we want to build our own Linux distribution and put it out there. At least it seems like that's what they want to do. But what if the management changes and says, no, we're not going that direction. What we really need to do is lock down our own code and, you know, pull an apple on everybody and be like, you know, we're going to make it so the hardware doesn't run anything else. And if it breaks, you can only take it to our stores and blah, 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 blah. And it could go that direction. If they thought they could make more money, they would do it because that's what these corporations are all about, kids. You know, Steve Jobs is dead and Bill Gates doesn't have any direct control. So if you have any respect for those two as individuals, programmed, you know, programmers, uh, directors of the companies, they're not involved anymore. The only people that are running these company companies are people that are looking at one thing, the bottom line. Are we in the black this month? Are we making more money? That's it. So follow the money, and that will give you their intention. But that's a good question, and I want to see what happens. And I guess really the only way to know that for sure is we're just going to have to let this unfold over time. But thank you for that very good question. Iason, Ison, I'm sorry I mispronounced your name. I still think it's cool. This is just the kind of comments I get on YouTube all the time. This came up on the same, this is a question that came up on the same video about, you know, can't beat them, buy them, whatever. Uh, I just clicked on this video to see what your video was about, not to tell you the truth. Uh, let's see. But to tell you the truth, the only people that should be talking about this are Linus Torvalds and the Linux developers and Richard Stallman. I don't know if you really understand how Linux got to be developed. And then the person went on to say, you know, give me the history of Linux like I didn't. And I didn't understand this comment. It came from a fellow named Glenn. And uh, the thing about it was, is that w why... Would you ever say to anybody, the only people that should be talking about it are whoever? This is Linux. It's an open community. I'm entitled to my opinion. I have a YouTube channel. I can share that opinion. It doesn't mean that I'm right. It doesn't mean that I'm wrong. Uh, most of the video in question, I speculated on heavily. I could be totally, completely out in left field. But still, this is Linux. Linux is open. It is an open community. And... As long as you're not, you know, saying hateful things about people directly or, you know, something some, breaking the rules somehow in, in some forum, you can pretty much talk about whatever you want to. So that's what I'm going to do. I find it interesting that in the Linux community, and it's one of the things that I don't like about it, is there is so much about you have to qualify yourself before you can have an opinion. There's always somebody looking down their nose at you and saying, you don't know enough to be able to speak intelligently on the subject. And boy, I wish we could do something about that as a whole. Uh, I'm not complaining about a comment on YouTube like it's a negative comment. So don't take it that way. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying here is that there's a lot of this, that people aren't allowed to have an opinion. And also, there's a lot of things where somebody will come along and they will give their first impressions of something. Well, it seems to me this is the way this is. And they could be completely wrong. But you see, from a marketing point of view, if you are one of those people who wants to spread the word about Linux and you're evangelizing about Linux, then you should be very concerned about people's first impressions. Because first impressions are everything in marketing everything in marketing. Doesn't matter whether they're right, it doesn't matter whether they're wrong. It matters that they got a bad impression of it and they walked away and they won't be coming back to your product, whatever that is. So if you think of Linux for a minute as a product, I know it isn't, it's a community and all this other stuff. That is one of the issues that we have to deal with. And that's a good example. I mean, we have a lot of this that comes up. If somebody says something about something, it's, you're not qualified to talk about this. You don't know what you're talking about, which is just a very un 
constructive way to begin a comment anyway. If you have something to add, that's great. Can you do it in a positive way that's a constructive part of the conversation maybe? Stop and think before you type is all I'm saying with that you know, thing right there. Here was a cool one I got from somebody named Helder. Joe Collins with many, 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 many commas there. You should open a franchise and teach Linux distros. Share your knowledge with us in full. Well, guess what, Helder? Guess what? You got it, babe. It's all on YouTube. Pretty much everything I know about Linux is already here in a video somewhere. So if you start watching all of my Linux-related videos, at by the time you get done, you're going to know everything that I know, and they go back four years. <laughs> so, I mean, really intense Linux, Linux videos. I have posted it all, babe. I'm not holding anything back. I've tried to at least uh, introduce every concept that I've come across in Linux. So have at it. I'm not holding anything back, and thank you for the very kind comment. And finally, this is a question that keeps coming up, and this is not the first person that has said this to me, so I don't quite know where this is coming from, but this came from Doug. It says, now that you are a YouTube powerhouse, thank you, would you consider doing an interview with Clem at Linux Mint? And we're talking about Clem Lefebvre at first. Most likely, the largest portion of your subs are Linux Mint users. Well, yeah, because I talk a lot about Linux Mint on this channel. Live streams are popular too, oh, well, let me tell you what, uh, I've said this before in past videos, and I will say it again in this one. If anybody can get the attention of Clem Lefebvre, and if he is willing to do a live stream with me, uh, like through Google Hangouts or something like that, and I can post it as a video, I am more than open to the idea. Uh, I've had a lot of people who have asked me whether you know I should start doing interviews like other Linux people do. And the problem with that is it's just the fact that the way my life works, it's hard for me to pick a day and say, okay, we're going to do this at 2 o'clock on Wednesday and you, you need to be available at that time. It's difficult to coordinate. I do this when I can and when I'm not busy with other things. I raise three other kids. I have a, a, no, my kids, not other kids. What a thing to say. I raise three kids, I have other interests, uh, I do a lot of other stuff that doesn't have anything to do with Linux. So really when I do these videos, it's kind of when I can and when I have the time and that sort of thing. And that's the way I want it. This isn't a job, gang. It's a hobby of mine. It's a passion that I share with you. But I will make an exception. I will completely rearrange my life if I could get an interview with Clem Lefebvre. Because he don't talk to nobody. So Clem, if you're out there, somebody knows Clem, see what, you know, give me a, contact me here, send me an email, come to the webpage, whatever, and I will be happy to talk to Clem Lefebvre. So there you go, gang. That's all of the really cool stuff that I collected over the last, I don't know, last one we did of these was in September. It's November now. So then maybe six, eight weeks at the most since this was done. So that's what I collected, and I hope that's cool for you. Uh, I don't know how many more of these we'll be doing in the future or when the next one may be. Nobody watches these videos. That's another thing. Nobody really gets into these as much as I think they would. I went back and looked, and they all get, you know, like kind of views. They get maybe a couple thousand views, and then it dies right off. So let me know. Do you like the Q&A videos? Do you want to... Do you want me to keep doing this, or would you rather just not worry about it? Whatever, you know? Uh, I don't know. It's up to you. Your feedback is always welcome. You need to tell me what's going on so I can just sit here and you know, talk about things you guys want to talk about instead of just blathering on about crap you don't care about, which is most likely the case anyway, or at least that's what I'm told on a daily basis by a small section of the people who view these videos. <laughs> <laughs> the mental abuse that goes on and on and on. Anyway, never mind. Please join the discussion at Easy Talk. That is the forum. It's for you guys. I don't spend a lot of time on Easy Talk, gang. I, I kind of check in to see what's going on, but it's really for you guys to talk. It is free, secure, and fun, and easy to sign into. And you can follow the link in the description for this video. It'll be right up top. Please be sure to give Easy Linux a like on Facebook if you are a Facebook user. Also, check out EasyLinux.com. If you want to get in touch with me, the Contact Us page is there, and uh, that's a really good way to get a hold of me. 
We also have freedompenguin.com that we need to talk about because freedompenguin.com is a website that has a lot of content from creators such as myself and it is run by Matt Hartley who is a very cool dude indeed and uh, you can go check that out and he's been very kind to us here at the Easy Linux Project. That's it. I'm done. I'm not going to run my mouth no mo. I'm going to just go off and drink my tea and publish the video and talk to you guys later, I guess. Bye.